Hello and welcome to this subject specific standardization training for 8202 electrical installations level 2 and level 3. One clear advantage of technicals is that it can reward high achieving candidates over those that just meet industry requirements. This isn't possible with qualifications such as 2365 because the marking checklist didn't differentiate between candidates. In order for differentiation to be achieved, marking must be supported by strong items of evidence. During this presentation, we'll look at items of evidence and we'll also look at tips for managing the assessment. We'll look at the overview of sample level two synoptic ass assessments. We'll look at evidence requirements, as well as examples of candidate generated evidence and center generated evidence. We'll look at the marking process and the marking grids, internal standardization, uploading of evidence, and then we'll summarize the key points of the presentation, as well as look at support materials available to centers running technicals. Assessments can create very busy environments. Assessors are supposed to be gathering evidence during the assessment, but easily they can be drawn off to carry out other tasks as candidates require materials, etc. Consider having assistance from support colleagues to help the logistics of the assessment. This will enable the assessor to focus on gathering the evidence. If an assessor leaves it to the end and decides to write up practical observation forms after the event, it could turn out that those forms or the evidence on those forms are not consistent with other evidence taken during the assessment. Also ensure that where you're doing practical assessments, that the rules of the assessment are followed, such as dimensions of the practical assessment rigs, because anything different could be seen by moderators as mistakes by candidates. If, because of space restrictions, you need to change any of the um, rigs or you have to change the assessment structures, be sure to inform City and Guilds before the assessment commences. For level three assessments, be sure that test rigs comply with the electric technical standards for test rigs 2015 document. If faults, etc. do not tally with known codes, moderators will also see these as errors. Level two and level three electrical synoptic assessments are always based on a plan. The level three plan is often more detailed than the one you see here. And candidates are required to do a much more detailed design, initial verification and fault finding tasks based on those scenarios. The level two plan is often more basic where candidates have to carry out a basic design in line with the IET on-site guide, as well as safety tasks such as safe isolation and working with access equipment and then they have to carry out an installation based on the scenario of the plan. With this level two synoptic assessment, candidates would be required to carry out five tasks. Task one would involve them to complete a circuit schedule pro forma and divide the installation into circuits based on the plan that was shown in the previous slide and they need to give reasons for their decisions. The design will be based on tables in the on-site guide. And then they would need to produce a detailed materials list describing why they have chosen particular types of finishes. We'll look at some of that evidence later on. They'd also have to provide a method statement for the safe isolation procedure. Task two would require them to carry out the safe isolation procedure. Task three would require them to use two types of access equipment Task four would be the major electrical installation and we'll see the detail of that on the next slide. And then task five, which must always be carried out at the end, would require candidates to carry out a reflective evaluation of the work they've completed. They need to consider what has gone well or what they may change if they were given the chance to carry out the assessment again. This drawing shows a sample of the main installation task. Although conduit and trunking have been used for this one, different wiring systems can be used for different series. The dimensions have been left blank for
for centers to complete and this way the installation can fit the space and dimension available at the center. Candidates must always try to install the items as seen on the drawing. Anything different can be seen as a mistake by moderators. Within the assessment packs, the evidence requirements are detailed under each task. Some evidence, such as that required for task one here, is only candidate generated evidence and does not require any PO forms by the assessor. Task four, on the other hand, which is the major installation task, does require PO forms under, uh, carried out by the assessor, as well as photographic evidence. More details on the photographic evidence is contained in the assessor's guide part of the assessment pack. The candidate generated evidence, such as you see here for task one, does not require any practical observation forms because the evidence really does speak for itself and assists towards marking and moderation. You can see clear differentiation between the two candidates in these examples. And here is another example of candidate generated evidence. Practical observation forms are an essential tool used in the marking and moderation process. Here is a, a sample for task two, the safe isolation task. And the practical observation forms require the assessor to record what went well during the assessment and what could have been improved. It doesn't need pages of narrative, but it needs to capture the essence of the assessment. Also, capturing the behaviours is a good way to differentiate between candidates. Use of words such as confident, good understanding, or didn't seek reassurance are good ways of capturing how the assessment went. A lot of candidates can do that sideways glance at the assessor and that way they're looking for reassurance. And if that happens, then perhaps that should be captured in what could be improved. Was the candidate hesitant? Or actually, sometimes they can be complacent towards the work they do. And in terms of safe isolation, that could compromise safety. So always try and capture what went well and what could be improved during the assessment. Photographs are another form of centre generated evidence. These are exclusive currently to level two assessments rather than level three. And here you can see for task four, which is the main installation task, photographs are taken at timed intervals. These times are stipulated in the assessment packs and they are intended to show progression of the work over the time period. A final photograph is required showing detailed uh, connections within the distribution board. But as you can see from each of these photographs of the installation task, candidates are not required to be in the photograph. The intention of the photograph is to see progression of the work undertaken. Also, you can see in the photographs that there is a named sheet displayed next to the board showing the candidate and the time at which the photograph was taken. Photographs are also required for the access equipment task. And these again, shouldn't be focused on the candidate, but should be focused on the area in which the access equipment was erected. So you can see from the tower scaffolding, it was quite easy level ground. And therefore the checks undertaken by the candidate would reflect that environment. Once all tasks are complete and evidence has been gathered for all tasks, but only once all tasks are complete, 
then the candidate record forms can be completed. This draws evidence from candidate generated evidence, as well as practical observation forms and perhaps photographic evidence. The example you see here is for assessment objective one or AO1, and this is for recall. So any evidence that's related to recall, and this could be maybe from the candidate generated evidence, good use of things like the on-site guide or good recall of cable sizes or why certain types of circuit breaker are used. Then this goes towards formulating the mark for recall from the evidence. So once all the candidate record forms or CRFs has been populated with the relevant evidence, it's time to consider marks for that evidence. This is done by referencing the marking grids. Firstly, you can see on the market grid, there's examples of knowledge expected for that particular AO. So once again, we're looking at AO1, which is recall. And so when you look at the examples, you can see that uh, you, we need detailed material lists or isolation procedures documented and followed and so on. Once you've seen what's relevant to that AO, we then need to look at the evidence that's on the CRF and see which band it falls in. Band one, for example, the lower end of the marks, you can see just below the examples we have for that band, candidates maybe have demonstrated knowledge and it's been limited or showing inaccuracies. Band two is for candidates where they're showing a good range of knowledge across the qualification, but they seek guidance from time to time. And band three, the higher end of the marking, is for candidates that carry out good quality work. Please don't think that these bands are grade boundaries, they are not. Here is another example of a marking grid, but this time for AO3, which is application of practical and technical skills. Once again, this has examples of evidence that relates to this AO. And again, you have the three marking bands. So for example, band two is where candidates have completed tasks within the allocated time and they've shown practical skills which are reasonably well developed, allowing most management measurements and tolerances to be met. And once again, it's worth reminding that these different bands do not reflect grade boundaries. The idea is for you to look to see where the evidence meets the most suitable band. It's also worth remembering that the marking at this stage isn't just for one task, but it's a holistic marking for all tasks that have been undertaken and all evidence that's been generated, but relevant to this particular AO. So whilst formulating a mark, it's important to look at the evidence that's being captured on the CRF and looking at the marking grids at the same time and seeing where the evidence falls within the band. So for example, we can see here, we've got many positives to take it to the top of band two and into band three, positive shown in green, negatives in red. Some negatives such as hesitancy which sits nearer the top of band two or just into the lower end of band three. But with many positives all round, that's probably going to sit just at the lower end of band three and, for example, 18 marks. So things to consider when thinking about internal standardization and quality assurance. If you work in a team, challenge each other's marking to ensure that the evidence is of the quality expected for the marks given. Consider marking the evidence generated by another member of staff, which can remove familiarity from the marking. 
Mark should be based on the assessment and the evidence generated at the time, not on what a candidate could have done a week or two beforehand. Make sure all evidence shows differentiation. Make sure that the evidence is clear that candidates are different. It's unlikely they have equal abilities in the same areas, so be sure evidence shows these differences. Most importantly of all, be honest with marking. If marks are inflated, maybe just for one or two candidates, and evidence shows differently, then all centre marks may be regressed, meaning all candidates' marks will be reduced. This can have an impact on high scoring candidates, but even more so on borderline past candidates because potentially they could end up failing the assessment. When uploading evidence to the portal, firstly, ensure scanned evidence is clear. Unfortunately, and fairly frequently, we sometimes see evidence which has been written in pencil, scanned at 300 dpi, and then when uploaded to the portal, you can't see anything that's written down on it. Ensure all evidence is clearly identifiable to a candidate. Ensure the declaration of authenticity is signed and uploaded because none of the evidence can be viewed unless the declaration is in place. Good practice for filing evidence is to use two files. Perhaps use one file for all candidates' evidence and photographs and another file for all the forms and declarations. And only ever upload relevant pages and try to remove blank pages. So a summary of what we covered. Manage the assessment to allow for quality evidence gathering. Use descriptions of words in practical observation forms and candidate record forms that allow differentiation and highlight behaviours. Mark once all the evidence has been gathered and mark holistically across the assessment objectives. The quality of all evidence is essential, not just for marking, but to support the moderation process. Standardise marks across the centre and challenge marks awarded by others. It can be dangerous to mark on familiarity. Mark with honesty, as it can have a detrimental impact on high achievers and borderline past candidates. And check all evidence is present and clear before uploading. For the latest updates and resources, visit the technicals pages on the City and Guilds website. Or if you're currently delivering our technical qualifications and you have a general inquiry, you can contact the technical quality team on the number or email shown. Thank you for viewing this presentation and I hope you found it a useful tool towards the delivery of synoptic assessments.